latest edition of a series of AFIS webinars that we've been holding for the last 12 months and a bit, uh, covering a whole host of issues relating to economics and business right across this continent that we all call home. Um, we thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Over the next 90 minutes or so, we're going to be covering some fairly interesting topics and discussions. This time round, we'll be nailing down the questions around pensions. How do we build resilient pension systems that actually work for the bulk of the populations across the economies that we have across East, West, South and North Africa as well? What are the current loopholes in the system? What are the inefficiencies that we need to essentially plug? What are the growth opportunities for not only in terms of raising the amount of people participating in formal pension systems, but also in looking for investment opportunities for these pension funds to deliver better returns to the people who are within this financial system? We'll be exploring that and plenty more in the next 90 minutes. My name is Raman Yang. I'll be your host and moderator for this particular uh, webinar for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. We have a fantastic lineup of discussants uh, lined up coming your way in a bit. A couple of housekeeping rules coming your way as well. Um, so you can ask questions in the Q&A section. It's right at the bottom um, of your app at the moment. And if you have any problems as well, there's a whole technical team that's supporting us to have this conversation today. So if you put any uh, comments over there saying, you know, you're having audio issues, connection issues, video issues, just put that into the comments below. And of course, we'll get right to it. So here's what you can expect uh, to come through in the next 90 minutes. We're first going to be having an expert presentation from Jacqueline Irving. She's a senior sector economist uh, covering senior economics, uh, sector economics rather, and development impact department at IFC. Thereafter, we'll get into a panel discussion um, with three fascinating people at the cutting edge uh, of the of what's happening within the business world uh, in pensions in Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, and of course, West Africa as well. In the middle, we'll have an expert conversation again. And then thereafter, of course, we'll open the floor to you for your comments, your feedback, and your questions. But first, our expert presentation, Jacqueline Irving from IFC. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rama, for the kind introduction and inviting me to join this webinar. I will help set the stage for the panel discussion by highlighting just a few of the main opportunities and challenges related to further growing and strengthening Africa's pension fund industries. First slide, please. Several dynamics, including notably increasing populations with growing middle classes and market reforms, have led to expanding pension systems across the region over the past decade and a half. Although one or a few large state-owned schemes continue to dominate in several countries, pension reforms generally have allowed a larger role for privately managed fund administrators. The shift from defined benefit to defined contribution has been gaining momentum, providing an overall competitive spur. I draw on a few charts in this presentation, highlighting local pension industry context and trends in asset growth and allocation for four of the largest pension sectors in Sub-Saharan Africa. Nigeria, Kenya, Namibia, and Botswana, with total assets for th South Africa's pension industry estimated at US $240 billion equivalent versus $32.3 billion for the next largest Nigeria. I've not included data for South Africa in the same chart. The chart at left shows strong growth of total pension industry assets over the decade and a half until the COVID crisis hit. Total assets declined slightly in US dollar terms in 2020 for sectors in Nigeria and Namibia. However, the chart at right shows total assets for all foreign markets continue to grow in local currency terms, although at a slower rate in Botswana, Kenya and Namibia than in 2019. The total asset figures mask diverging outcomes among funds within a market by industry sector. Assets likely declined over 2020 in local currency terms or grew more slowly for those funds serving workers in industries, especially hard hit by the pandemic, leading to job losses, pension fund withdrawals, and reduced contributions. The next slide, please. So participation rates in pension fund systems were still relatively low before the COVID crisis hit, largely due to low income levels and low savings rates and linked with this, the still predominant role of the informal sector in economies. Some countries have made significant progress in raising participation rates. For example, Pen Kenya's pension coverage ratio 
proportion of the labor force participating in a pension arrangement was 20% in 2019, up from 15% in 2015, although still low compared to the global average of 54% based on ILO data. Next slide, please. The COVID crisis impact on markets in early 2020 shed new light on the importance of a more diversified portfolio approach that allows for investment in a range of asset classes as a way of enhancing risk management, large scale withdrawals of foreign capital from emerging markets with a flight to cash and safe haven assets, put new focus on the importance of developing and strengthening local investors with longer term investment horizons. In this way, crisis may provide an opportunity to to deepen local investor participation in the local market. Lack of a diversified portfolio approach where it exists may reflect factors that can vary by market and level of development. These can include national regulations on holding certain asset classes as well as internally set ceilings and limits. As the slide shows, however, investment in listed equities, the left chart blue bars, and corporate bonds, the right chart blue bars, for the largest emerging African pension markets fall well below national regulatory ceilings, which are in the orange bars. The gray bars chart the number of listed equities left and corporate bonds at right by market. Next slide, please. Allocation to alternative assets also tends to be well below regulatory ceilings for these large emerging pension sectors typically accounting for a tiny share of total sector assets. As you see in this chart, where we have disaggregated data for Kenya and Nigeria's pension sectors, the ceilings on investment in private equity venture capital and real estate investment trusts are shown by the dark and light orange bars respectively. So in the case of these large African markets, national regulatory ceilings do not explain limited diversification. Pension funds in these and many other markets remain challenged by a lack of appropriate local product. Limited local product of longer tenors, which would be in line with the longer term liability structures of pension funds, remains a particular constraint. Limited product that pension fund funds can and want to invest in can be due to macroeconomic and financial system context, and a shortage of investable securities on the local capital market impedes the market in attracting local investors. This lack of investor interest then becomes an obstacle to attracting new issuers, resulting in a chicken and egg dilemma, impeding further capital market development as well as further portfolio diversification. A recent study I co-led with the African Development Bank's David Ashkabor and colleagues found that it's not uncommon, including in the largest markets, for asset managers to approach asset owners with ready-made products that may not suit the particular investment needs and interests of pension funds. Pension fund managers across African markets emphasize to us the importance of developing more structures that would appeal and be well suited to the interests of the investors as well as the issuers. In markets where pension funds proactively engage with local investment bankers at an early stage of product development, the products are likely to be more relevant to investor needs and of more interest. Appropriate sequencing of market regulatory policy reforms is also important so as to strike the right balance in safeguarding pension funds fiduciary role while enabling them to maximize returns on investment, as is strengthening investors' capacity to evaluate and manage associated risk. Going forward, for pension sectors and their economies to more fully capitalize on opportunities, it will be important to accelerate reforms to further grow local pension funds, including by enabling more extensive participation, with the informal sector still comprising a majority of the private sector in a number of African economies. Extending pension coverage to informal sector workers is a priority if there is to be more comprehensive participation across a labor force. This would need to be accompanied by targeted and yet widespread financial literacy, both in the educational system curriculum and at the point of financial transaction to actively promote an increased culture of savings. There also may be large untapped potential for take up of digital, digitally enabled longer term savings micro products for other life savings goals, as well as retirement geared to young adult populations in particular. Through pension funds and other contractual savings institutions, individuals and households can better manage risk, grow savings, and smooth their consumption over time. Where pension funds seek out longer-term investment opportunities that maximize returns and diversify risk while safeguarding member savings, 
pension funds can have strong demonstration effects in creating a savings culture and mobilizing local capital to help build infrastructure and meet other longer term development needs. So I will now turn over to Rama and end with a slide that proposes a few questions for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, some pretty interesting data that you've laid out there with respect to the pension markets that we're seeing in Nigeria, Kenya, Namibia, Botswana. And of course, South Africa at the moment has one of the largest pension systems on the continent. And that will be a reference point that will certainly come up um, in the course of the discussion that we're having over the next uh, 90 and a bit minutes. Uh, for now, though, let me introduce you to my panelists. They have decades of experience between them in the pension space. Uh, managing funds or essentially dealing with people who are managing funds. Uh, we're going to start with Ngate Kirunge. He's the head of the Secretariat of the Kenya Pension Funds Investment Consortium. We also have Oguche Aguda, uh, the CEO of the Pension Fund Operators Association of Nigeria on the panel. We also have Masha Maharaj, who's um, the uh, security services cluster head for Sub-Saharan Africa at City. A little later on, of course, we'll also be talking to Olano Makubela, the executive in charge of retirement, retirement fund supervision in South Africa as well. That's coming a little bit later in the conversation. Um, but first, let me start with you, um, Masha. You, you've, you've, you, we've, we've heard Jacqueline there setting the stage very comprehensively uh, for us here. And I guess ultimately the question here is what what incentives, as far as regulation is concerned, um, will enable pension funds to actually put more money into long-term development projects within the African continent? Yeah, hi, Rama. Thanks for the question and good afternoon, everybody. So, you know, it's an interesting one. In terms of regulations and what will actually incentivize pension funds into actually putting more money into infrastructure, it's really about returns, right? So if you looked at what you actually shared and certain things, not even the breach limits are not being breached in terms of any private equity or anything really, is it talks about why not. And a large part of it is how do we value these investments? So how do we create, and I'm calling it almost a taxonomy, in terms of understanding these investments and so that when pension funds and asset managers are being compared like for like, and let's be honest, it's quite heterogeneous in terms of what they're investing in, but what is the actual return? Because ultimately, while we're trying to manage very much a risk-averse kind of industry, pension funds normally would be because we're protecting the assets for both you and me as a pension fund holder, but how do they actually show the value with modifying, with understanding the risk? And that really comes to the role of pricing houses, the role of keeping these assets separate, making sure that it's safe. So those are the elements that I would really want us to focus on. Um, that it, does this also come down to just a simple question of um, if if a government is willing to come into the market and say, I'm going to borrow, you know, three year money, as, as Kenya did fairly recently, three year money uh, at almost 12 percent. Um, at that point, I mean, you have a very strong incentive to just park your money in government bonds and not really look at anything else, not bother with doing any due diligence on on, on real estate or infrastructure projects. Is, is, is that part of the problem here? It is absolutely part of the problem, right? Because it's if money is normally considered safe and we can just go play it and get a proper return without seeing the value of what those infrastructure spends actually bring to the market, it's very hard. Also, due diligence, understanding the risk, understanding what you're actually investing in becomes problematic. So government cannot be incentivizing, and you have to think short-term, long-term goals. So if we want to grow a market, you have to have infrastructure in a growing markets like ours, sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa itself as well, whether it's an ESCOM crisis or, you know, whether we see load shedding across the board in our region, what can we do to actually incentivize investment into these things that ultimately makes sub-Saharan Africa more valuable to outside investors? Um, oh, Gucci, let me come to you because I, I know when we were having this this discussion a little earlier, um, you mentioned that we should actually flip the script in terms of how we look at these these sec these fund allocations, right? So the the regulators basically told uh, PE funds you can put money into this asset class up to a specific point, but you argued that we need to flip that around and instead say we need to look at that as a floor. So you have a minimum that you need to put in to say REITs or PE. Elaborate on that point for us, Abhijay. 
Yeah, so um, with um, most African countries, like in Nigeria, the allocation to the alternatives is really low. And even if it was to go to about 5%, it still wouldn't be as high. So I'm arguing for, you know, a floor of 5%, even 3% for places like Nigeria, where um, the investments to infrastructure, private equity, and other alternatives is less than 1%, right? So if we were to put a, a floor of about 3%, there's still room. You know, some will argue um, that, you know, that um, enables irresponsible behavior. But, but I think it's an industry-wide problem. If everyone looks at it as a fact of we need to grow this to this level, and, and it's a small level, 3 to 5% within this period, and some things need to be in place, so we work together. Um, I think the incentives are not are not there as much. You know, something uh, Masha alluded to, uh, and you also spoke about, if govies are, are returning 12%, and in Nigeria at some point, 18 20%, then there really is no incentive to, to invest in anything outside of that. And, and, and like, you know, we also mentioned, nobody ever got fired for investing in, in government bonds. So um, the, um, the pension funds will just stay safe and, 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 and end their fees. And, the, and, and that uh, to, uh, to both you as well. Um, because how, how then do we deal with the moral hazard problem that you actually pointed to, that you alluded to in your response? I mean, if I tell people, look, your limit is, or rather your floor is 10% of your cash into real estate, how do we then put in structures that essentially protect investors' funds that are being managed by these funds in order to make sure that we don't have, you know, incidents that we did, for example, in the 90s in Kenya, where funds are just throwing money into real estate investments or highly liquid. And when people actually needed money, the pension funds just didn't have them. I think, I think you're, you're, you're muted, Uguche. Yeah, so I was saying something Jacqueline uh, mentioned and alluded to in her presentation was, you know, the, the pension practitioners getting involved with the investment banks early on to co-create. And I think that's the word that we'll see and, and we need to get used to co-create. So typically it was a case of, you know, I'm a fund structure, I'm an investment bank, I'm a financial advisor, I cook something and I give it to eat. And you say, no, it doesn't taste well. Go back again, I cook something. Why, why don't we get in the kitchen together and cook it together, you know? as uh, the assets owners and the fund managers and the advisors, you know, from the early stage to be able to, you know, ask ourselves, what are we looking at? What are we trying to do? What risk are we? And just coming together on that, you know, platforms, which uh, I'm sure Ngatia will, will get into, uh, which Kepfik and, and uh, other such platforms are, are trying to do. Um, Ngatia, <laughs> elaborate on that. Mama, before that point, can I quickly just say one thing? I think... You know, your point is incredibly valid, right, in terms of making sure that there's money for pension fund holders as they have to want to take money out. I think we have to be careful. So absolutely, there should be some sort of percentage that must be allocated. And I like the flow idea, right, rather than the cap, because it does actually incentivize it. We have to be very careful. I'm a custodian. So, and uh, Alana will be happy because, you know, Reg 28 is obviously a big thing in our world. <laughs> But the point is to manage that risk. So to keep it and make sure from a reserve perspective that there's enough. You know, we can't, pension funds, I know in most places, would not obviously be able to go into ODs to manage your operational and outflow is normal. So in built, when you're having floors for alternative investments, there also has to be proper floors for what you can actually take out. So pension fund holders can take their money when they need it. Sorry, Gesha. Got you. You have the floor now. Sorry, Rama, could you, could you just uh, repeat the question? Just so I'm a bit Yeah, so, so, so the, main, the main issue we're trying to, we're trying to park, uh, pick apart here is, is uh, we like the idea that Aguja has put forward, right? Instead of talking about, you know, you can having a cap on how much you can allocate to specific asset classes, why don't we flip that around and say, here's the floor, here's a mandatory minimum that you have to allocate to say PE or real estate over X period of time. But that brings with it a couple of moral hazard issues. How do we then avoid, for example, um, instances where funds just decide to throw money at dodgy real estate investments and then mm -hmm. call it a day no one's held to account? Yeah, I'm of a, I'm of a bit of a different opinion. Uh, I think there is uh, value in keeping it as a as a cap rather than a flow. Um, what we have seen, and 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 you are right, Rama. What you have seen is that where you have a floor, 
there is then now the potential for, um, let's call it regulatory abuse, yeah, where, where you have investments that are selected purely, or at least not purely, that have the, one of the strongest elements going for them is the fact that the pension scheme must invest. And, um, and that's not a good position for the pension scheme to be in. In my opinion, if the opportunities aren't compelling enough for there to be a natural flow of capital into them, the question should be why. And the answer is rarely that we have not been compelled to do so. Yeah? Prescribed assets to me will only get you so far. And then you will find a way for um, these pension schemes and their fund managers will find a way to meet that, that, um, that uh, particular mandate without actually meeting it. Yeah. So my, 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 my whole thinking is we need to recognize that, yes, we are not as pension schemes, we are not as active as we'd like to be, but also to recognize that that's really a function of where we are in our life cycle. And that um, given sufficient time and given, you know, the growing expertise of, of our stakeholders, of the industry, and with the investments becoming a lot more compelling, as we've just been told, you know, engaging with the pension schemes earlier on, that becomes now more natural for the investments to flow into these alternative assets. And it's also stickier. It also is not really just based on regulations, which can be changed at any time. Yeah. So what happens in the future with the, 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 the floor is changed from 10 to 5, then you understand that you would have to understand where everyone would end up back at 5. What happens if you remove the floor altogether? Then you're back where we are today. Yeah, I think if we're thinking about long-term development of our markets, it's important to ask ourselves, what are the hindrances? And in my opinion, the hindrance is not that we, have, we are not being compelled to do so. Um, Ogoche, do you want to qu quickly jump in and respond to, to Ngati's argument before I put in my, my own rejoinder? Yeah, so I think what came to mind, you know, as a dad, you know, you tell your son or you tell your daughter, I want you to have straight A's. But you've got to pay their fees, you've got to buy laptops for them, you've got to take them to school, and you've got to enable them. So um, so, so I guess what I'm advocating is participatory uh, regulation. So it's not just prescribing a flaw, but, but working with the industry to say over a period. So, of course, I, I wouldn't, you know, prescribe anything reckless to say you, you must meet these targets. So it's over a period, you know, over a five-year period, let's work together to, and this is persuasive, you know, so, so I'm talking from an industry perspective, maybe not a regulator to say, um, and within my association, you know, to persuade, to say, you know, guys, let's work together to see if we can get to this level within three to five years. And one of the barriers, you know, we need to engage, we need to find the issuers, we need to get co-investors, we need to get DFI together. So it's a program over a, a number of years, I guess. But if there's nothing to look at, is there's no goal to aim at, um, then, then you never score. But, but yeah, they have to have a goal uh, to aim at, in my view. Um, Ngati, you, you, you mentioned in your argument that, as you see it, the problem is not that pension funds have not been compelled by government, essentially pushed, for lack of a better word, into investing in specific asset classes. Um, you don't see that as the main hindrance as to why fund managers have been conservative in allocating um, capital. So what are the hindrances to being experimental, for lack of a better word? I use that word very loosely in, our, in, in this particular context. But what are the hindrances as you see it from your perspective? Sure. Um, first, let me, let me be very clear that, um, you know, as Kepfic, we, are, we, we have a target of at least 5% of our assets to go into infrastructure. So the goal is the same. Yeah, and that's important to, 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 to state. Now, when we went out to talk to our members, to talk to the local pension schemes as to why they're not participating in alternative assets and infrastructure in particular, we received um, more or less uh, four, four, four answers in different versions. The first was, um, number one, the pension schemes are unaware of the opportunities in the first place. Yeah, so... Pension schemes only get to hear about this road project or a power project when they see the announcement in the papers. And that's not a surprise, given that um, it's, it's, you know, local pension schemes have not traditionally been known as a source of financing for infrastructure opportunities. So you wouldn't expect, you know, an investment bank, a sponsor, a transaction advisor to go knocking on the doors of pension schemes. 
The second thing is, even if they were uh, aware of these opportunities, there's limited investment expertise internally. And um, that's not just within the pension schemes themselves, but also with their stakeholders. If the market has been dominated by stocks and government bonds, then um, you can, it's understandable why the fund managers will have the capacity to assess you know, a good equity or, or assess the cash flow, the credit risk of a bond. But um, why would they have someone on staff that understands how a power plant works? Yeah. So internal expertise has been lacking really because they, you know, they hasn't, there hasn't been any need to have that expertise. And the third reason we, 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 we received was just the, the, the pure size of these opportunities. I mean, they are significant. You know, you're talking about in many cases in the hundreds, if not billions of dollars. And um, in a market where we are operating with investment caps, um, it's, 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 it's very difficult for a single pension scheme to, to take advantage of these opportunities given, you know, the, the sheer size. And lastly was regulatory uncertainty. No one wants to fall afoul of the regulator. Uh, and so, you know, when in doubt, what do people do? Nothing. And so what we, what, you know, uh, those are the four reasons why actually Kepfic was formed and Kepfic really being a consortium of local pension schemes that have come together to jointly assess and invest into, into alternative assets. Um, we were formed for those very reasons. So to bring, uh, you know, a robust pipeline of opportunities to our membership, to help with uh, internal um, capacity building, to get them just as familiar with how a road project works as, you know, uh, any other equity or bond, um, to engage with the regulator to ensure that there is um, there are no surprises, and to you know to ensure that the regulator is very clear on what. Um, infrastructure assets look like and why our membership should invest in them. And finally, because of the pure size of the of the of the opportunities, to pool together these pension schemes so that um, you're not looking at one pension uh, investing 100 million dollars. Instead, you could have 10 pensions investing 10 each. So those are the those are the main reasons that we are seeing or that we had uh, that that are behind the reasons why pension schemes haven't really been as active as they could have been. All right. Um, let's let's then build this this let's build out this this regulatory wish list, right? That that we'd all like to see. Um, if you had the chance to essentially tell regulators, at least in our respective markets, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, and we tell them, listen, this this is what we would like to do, or rather, this is what we'd like you to do from a legal perspective, from an operational perspective, in order to make our lives easier. What are the top three things on your list, Ngatia? Uh, well, for one, it's clarity. And in, in our case, I'll tell you, we, in Kenya, we have a very forward-thinking regulator. Uh, and what we did with the regulator, essentially, is we sat them down. Um, we were able to show them international best practice and how pension schemes the world over are really the biggest owners of any countries, of many countries' um, hard infrastructure. And from those discussions, our regulator actually introduced a distinct asset category called infrastructure for for pension schemes to 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 invest in that's the one that has the 10% uh, cap now just that alone signals to the fund managers and to the pension schemes that the regulator is saying put in 10% into this asset class so it's not it's, it 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 stops being esoteric and now becomes mainstream that's the that I would say is the is the biggest thing that we have seen from uh, regulatory engagement. Um, that would be, I, you know, in 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 my opinion, the biggest thing. That's the biggest thing that we have seen. The second the second uh, uh, item in terms of uh, regulation is the choice of fund managers. So here in 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 Kenya, the fund management the fund managers have the have fiduciary duty over. Uh, the management of, of uh, the, the, their client funds, the pension schemes. And in the past, you know, the, you've, the, fund, the pension schemes have had one fund manager or a number of fund managers to do essentially everything, to look at stocks, bonds, property, everything. Yeah. Whereas now what we are looking at and what we are pushing for, and in fact, the regulator has actually given us their blessings, is for pension schemes to be able to procure specific managers for specific asset classes. 
because it's um, you know it might be a stretch to assume that the best in class manager for equities would also be suitable for infrastructure. But if the regulator allows these pension schemes to hire different managers for different asset classes, then you have greater specialization. And from that greater specialization, you can expect to have you know, better investment opportunities, which will result in lower risk and higher return for, for, for pension schemes in general. Uh, okay, Jay, what's on your what's on your regulatory wish list? What would you like um, the regulators in Nigeria to to do to make your life easier? Yeah, so so I, I know this is recorded, so I, so I need to watch my words. Um, just joking, but 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 you know, um, so 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 I'll start with um, a, a political answer, um, um, which which is true. Uh, the regulator has been quite accommodating. I mean, if you look at the growth of Nigeria's pension industry over the years, it's been phenomenal, and it's really been growing um, at a phenomenal rate. And, and that's kudos to the regulator. Um, so it, not just in Nigeria, but in most markets, the market is always above the regulator. So the regulator is always trying to play catch up. And I think you always see that. So I, I think it's a desire to be to dialogue more, to engage more, because the um, the landscape is always changing. Uh, and, and I see Olano nodding his head, you know, because landscape is always changing. Um, and just to be in a position whereby, you know, there's a lot of engagement. One of the things we've tried to do in Nigeria is to get some of the regulators on various of our committee meetings and so that they can feel the pulse of, of the market. You know, one thing a regulator doesn't want to do is to be far removed from the market. So, you know, you know so, so, so that fine balance of, you know, being in bed with the markets and, and still um, regulating it is I think what you know regulators need to 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 balance, and I guess what we're asking more from 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 our regulators. Uh, Marcia, uh, <laughs> but, but let's let's. I mean, getting, I'd like to get your your feedback from because I know you're approaching this in the perspective of. Um, a custodian, someone's providing custodial services, right, uh, to a lot of these funds. What would be on your your regulatory wish list? Uh, Asha, are you with us? It looks like she's frozen. Yeah, that's very likely. Okay, we'll try and uh, get her back on the line uh, as soon as we can. But in the meantime, Agusha, there's an interesting question here for you. Um, especially with respect to to what Nigerians uh, Nigerian pension funds rather have done, so I'm just going to sort of compress it just a little bit uh, before I get into a conversation with our, our regulatory representative. Um, in view of the forex management challenges and devaluation risks, why have pension funds not stepped in to plug the funding gap, especially for infrastructure projects which can be provided on a user charge basis? Yes, yeah, so. Um, it, it's a journey, it's a process, and you know pension funds, by virtue of their makeup, are, are typically um, safety first. Uh, they always think safety first. So um, government bonds, so that they don't lose the money, right? Um, and then the next thing is you know returns, um, and and the next thing is you know how how liquid is it? So how many infrastructure projects within Nigeria can, can meet that? You know what I always call the PSL: profitability, safety, and liquidity tests, right? Um, how, how many of them are structured in, in a way that, um, you know, it's private sector managed? Um, you don't have to um, take on um, public sector risk, you know, with short governments uh, and, and long infrastructure projects. So those issues will be there. Uh, however, there is a lot of work that the pension industry is doing along with you know investment banks along with some guarantee companies to invest in infrastructure and there is um, a number of infrastructure investments we're doing on a small scale in, in different sectors I, I think what uh, the person asking the question would like to see is to see that on a large scale and consistently and I guess it's a journey um, we, we're getting there and there's a lot of discussion and engagement around how that happens so it's not something that just happens um, immediately, but there needs to be that market engagement along with the government, along with, you know, the um, issuers and, and, and just uh, the, the DFIs. Um, why would DFIs necessary for that engagement? 
just walk walk me through the the the, the, the thinking around the risk and liquidity aspects of it because one of the counter arguments someone might make is, I mean, look, if, if Nigerian pension funds are sitting on $30 billion worth of like, you know, funds and management, why would they need foreign capital to come in? Yeah, so it's not really a case of needing extra cash. It's number one, expertise, um, just in terms of uh, capacity building, in terms of technical help, uh, and also in terms of blended finance. You know, because if you're going to uh, lend to and invest in infrastructure profitably, um, the returns that you are expecting might not be profitable for, you know, either getting a new power plant or creating a, a, a new uh, a water borehole or water pipe, you know. But, you know, if the DFIs come in and bring concessional capital, then the cost to the user, you know, goes down. So, so there has to be that blend of the commercial uh, finance and then the concessionary finance. So there has to be an ecosystem, you know, uh, and, and the DFIs also help to de-risk. Um, uh, some of these, and it's not necessarily just funding that that, that we require from from the DFI. It's just in terms of structuring, blending, capacity building, and just uh, sharing of, of of experience. Um, Mash, Mash, back uh, to, to the conversation. Um, we're talking about regulatory wish lists. Uh, just before you dropped off briefly, from from the perspective of a of, of a custodian, what's on your regulatory wish list? What would you need to make your work across markets in Sub-Saharan Africa? easier. Yeah, so I think a lot has happened. I think, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, if we look at over the last decade or a little bit longer, we've come a long way, right? We've seen pension fund reforms across the board. We've seen that that, that pension fund uh, investment or has to be separated from the in-house. So custodians are actually managing the assets, which is really has helped a lot. I think from an accounting perspective and that whole around fund accounting and understanding NAVs, et cetera, et cetera, we, we're getting there. I think we are a lot. South Africa is very, very settled, I think, in a lot of ways. You know, we have a massive industry here. I think we can get a bit better. You know, we had um, quite an interesting conversations, Gucci and I, previously around, you know, there's lots of skills in this space. So from a global custodian like City, for example, that understands what we would need to do from a pension fund industry across the board, that's fantastic. But in, in markets like Nigeria, which is a little bit different, we have pension funds, custodians being very different for your typical global custodians or even your regional ones. So there's that. I think there'll be it'll be interesting to see if we can get to a more streamlined process where you see custodians can we do both normal custody as well as for pension funds in markets like Nigeria. But I think it I like the ideas that have come across, you know, clarity. I like the fact that there's asset managers that can do specific things. But for me, when it comes to more than just custody, but valuing those NAVs, it's about how do we get uh, players in the market that is, we, and they are some, definitely, right? But I think we have a road to walk together to get private equity um, valuations properly in, to get infrastructure valuations in properly in. So we have that common uh, kind of view of what those assets are. And that helps not just the custodian, right? Because I'm an African, so it's really about what we can do in an African space. It's really for our pension fund holders. Indeed, it certainly is. Um, I'd, I'd like to bring in um, Olano Makubela. He's the uh, executive in charge of retirement fund supervision at the Financial Sector Conduct Authority uh, in South Africa. He's got extensive uh, experience on the policy making and the regulatory side uh, of business. He's spent 19 years at the National Treasury uh, in South Africa. He's bringing a regulatory perspective uh, to the conversation. Um, Mr. Makubela, you've been listening patiently uh, for the last uh, 40 minutes or so uh, to the conversation we've been having. What, what do you make of the ideas coming out so far? Thank you, Mr. Rama. Yes, extremely patiently. <laughs> you know, when you are dying to say something, <laughs> but you kind of need to, to wait for your turn. So I'm going to seize this moment. <laughs> and, and a good day to your, to your audience. I, I mean, this has been really such an interesting uh, discussion. And maybe let me make a few quick points. Um, starting with the prescribed uh, assets one, um, because I can't I can't let that one go easily. And look, sorry, Mr. Gucci, you know I, I'm with Mr. Ngatia on this one. I mean, South Africa has a long experience with prescribed assets, um, right? Going back to, you know, the 70s, the 80s, 
And, and empirical, empirical evidence shows that, you know, um, prescription hasn't done well for, for the pension fund members, right? So when you track the returns between, you know, um, government bonds vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, your, your equity market, you will realize that um, the funds actually underperformed um, during that period uh, where we had the prescription. And, and it's similar cases with also some of our neighboring um, um, countries. And, and there are other reasons, right, which have been mentioned around, you know, potentially distorting markets, uh, but also the, the market discipline issue. Um, so, Mr. Rama, we, we come from a very hard last uh, 12, 13 years where we were dealing with state capture issues, um, right? And, and so when, when this issue around prescribed assets so, you know, read its head um, a year to two years ago, um, the public was literally up in arms, um, right? Because they felt this is another way of government to try and force um, money into government uh, bonds and, and issues around market discipline there and what will ultimately happen with that money. And so those governance issues are, are still quite, you know, Im important. Um, and then one does need to, to, to factor them in. Mr. Gatia is right. You know, I think as the regulator, um, the best you can do is to signal. So we've done something similar on infrastructure. In fact, I was just checking with someone at the National Treasury a few minutes ago where we are with gazetting the revised Regulation 28. So, so for the first time, we have introduced also an asset class around infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Ngatia, we've been quite aggressive. So we have put a maximum limit of 45%. <laughs> right? And, and, and part of it is to accommodate already existing exposures, um, um, right? But we do feel that signaling is so important because then, then the funds are able to say, look, if, if, if the regulator is enabling this as part of their asset allocation instrument, then, then, then it's not a bad um, a thing, right? So, so that signaling is, is quite important. But look, I, I also understand where Mr. Oguche is coming from. Uh, to a certain extent, I'm, I'm still on Mr. Ngatia's side <laughs> because I think the question still, you know, remains if you are not seeing the necessary traction in investment in some of these uh, products, you know, um, what do you do? And by the way, there are those, although they're in the minority in South Africa, who will argue even government's prescribed assets enabled the infrastructure in South Africa to be built, um, right? Just to present, you know, both both arguments. But yeah, I, I'm still more, I'm still more on, you know, providing a maxima and, and allowing the markets to, to, yeah. to drive. Uh, Mr. Rama, the other point is around Mr. Oguja's good point on the regulator having a feel of the markets. You know, I've always said, as a policymaker and and a regulator, you must be careful not to try and regulate something you don't understand, because then you you stand a good chance of messing it up, <laughs> right? And and so I remember when we first you know introduced the hedge funds regulation in South Africa, you know we literally had to do a roadshow and visit a number of you know these hedge fund managers to understand exactly how the products um, um, uh, work, because then that informs you on how the regulation should look like. I mean, the challenge with the regulator, and to be honest, it, at, at times we can be passionate about our role, right, and, and therefore be quite conservative um, in terms of how we, 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 view, we view the world. And, and maybe at times it's right. Um, I, I will not share my views around cryptos for now, but maybe we'll touch on that later. But, but it is important for the regulator to really have a feel of the industry, you know, the developments taking place and be able to come up with appropriate um, uh, regulation. And, and that's why the FSCA has adopted this principles-based approach to regulation vis-a-vis -vis rules approach, right? Right. And so um, we are embedding it in the, in the system. Something that, that, that you mentioned a little earlier. Um, because yeah. with respect 
to the questions around yeah, um, from from the populist argument that we tend to hear, and this is now me with my journalist hat on. The populist argument that we tend to hear is that look, these pension funds, quote unquote, have all this cash and assets under management. And at the same time, in many of the countries that we operate in, it's the same story in Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa as well. You've got huge infrastructure needs. We need yeah. roads, we need better power, we need better housing. And a lot of people would say, look, th th these are clear, straightforward needs that you know pension funds could put money into, and yet they're not doing so. So from where you sit as, as, as a regulator, how do you deal with that political pressure that might occasionally come up where governments in charge are saying, look, can't you guys just do something, you know, nudge, nudge pension funds in this direction? Yes, yes. And, and it's a good question. And I'm glad you use the word nudge uh, because it talks to the behavioral economics, um, which, which we have embraced actually quite a lot when I was at Treasury and at the FSCA. Uh, because at times, um, if not in most instances, compulsion can have unintended consequences, um, right? People can decide to just push back. Uh, for the sake of of doing it, so 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 nudging is quite an important um, um, uh, instrument to use. Look, Mr. Rama, at times you do need to push back at government as a regulator, uh, and I think you know all regulators in the world will appreciate the point I'm going to make that we have to at all times um, um, fight for our independence and whatever we do. We should do without any fear, um, favor, um, et cetera. And, and, and so, you know, you, you do need to stand your ground. But of course, you need to understand also you are operating in a political economy, <laughs> right? So we ultimately report to our political masters, who's the minister of finance, et cetera. And so you do need to navigate some of those issues. The way of doing it is to actually provide the politicians with the facts, right? Provide them with the facts, provide them with the scenarios. Um, and, and yes, they will ultimately make the decision, but at least you hope it will be an informed um, um, decision. And, and, and I'm glad to say, at least in South Africa, you know, um, um, the Minister of Finance has been, you know, very much um, open-minded and listens. In fact, all the previous, uh, except one <laughs> in the last five years, Whose name we shall not mention. They they do listen and 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 and, and, and you know take take our comments uh, on on board. Indeed, uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Makubela. We'll certainly have you around uh, for for the remainder of the conversation. I'm sure there's some questions that will come up um, that your regulatory perspective would be extremely invaluable on. Um, yes. But I just want to move the conversation on and bring my my, my panel back in. Um, Gatia, I saw you had your your hand raised at one point. Um, is there something you'd like to to chip in on? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, thank you. It was just um, just a comment on that. You know, pension schemes are actually funding infrastructure right now, and they're doing that through buying government bonds. Yes, so they 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 are financing uh, the development of infrastructure through the public sector. And one of what 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 we what we try to make clear is that they can also do the same through the private sector especially or through private sector channels, especially in an environment where we find ourselves now macroeconomically, where there are concerns about growing government uh, deficits, um, increased concerns about uh, debt levels. Um, and so what that means is that structurally the government can do less, even if there is money available from the pension fund community. And so when the government has to step back, it provides a great opportunity for the private sector now in this case institutional investors like pension schemes to step forward so i think it's um, there's a bit of a bit of a misconception that pension schemes are not contributing to the economic development of the country as it as it stands now what we're trying to do is get them to do, to be to do so in a more direct manner or in a manner that is that is uh, that doesn't crowd out um, um, the rest of the economy and then allows government to focus on what government can focus on, on areas that maybe are not as, uh, would not attract private sector capital, whereas uh, the areas that can and can do directly should be maximized by, by, the, by the institutional investor community. Indeed. Uh, I'd just like to move on to, to the question around unexplored territory, because in, in many of the economies that we operate in, 
the, the bulk of employment, the bulk of the jobs that are created tend to be in the informal sector rather than in the formal sector. In Kenya, you've got roughly 500, 600,000 new jobs being created in the informal sector by you know, official estimate um, every single year. In Nigeria, the number is, 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 is far, far higher. How do we structure pension funds or create systems that can essentially rope in these individuals into the pension fund system, um, given all the constraints that we know of operating in the informal sector, for example, irregular income. Um, Oguche, I'll let you have the first crack at that. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll go back to rudiments of, of, of marketing to, to answer this. Um, and I'll just use uh, the, the 4P model, which is the product, which is the place, which is the pricing, and, and which is promotion. Uh, so, so number one is the product, uh, which you know in, in Nigeria we're working on, we, we're calling it a micro pension. So, so micro pension is a product designed for those in the informal sector, sort of self-sponsored. If you're not working in a formal sector, but then you know how does the product um, attract? You know, so if you're asking people to save, you know, and um, I was just reading some stats earlier this uh, week about. Um, nearly 90 million Nigerians live on less than $2 a day. So if you're asking someone who lives on less than $2 a day to save, I mean, he wants to use that money to eat, to send his school to, to school and, and et cetera. Um, so how can we tie savings to something he needs now? Um, for instance, health insurance. So, so one of the ways that we're trying to relaunch our micro pension product in Nigeria is trying to bundle. So, so, so I think that's one, bundling. Bundling uh, insurance with products that people um, using their every, every, everyday everyday life. Uh, when we go to a place, we speak to distribution, it needs to be something that people can engage, how they engage in their normal life. So um, if they want to open a bank account, you know, a USSD code or via WhatsApp. So again, we are trying to work with platforms to see how easy it is to to just sign up for, for, for micro pensions or pensions as opposed to um, having to go to an office, having to cumbersome forms and things like that. So we need to make it easier for, for those people to, to get involved and, and and also with little or no technological experience whereby they, they have to use apps and, and things like that. So there's a place for apps, but we need to be a bit more uh, granular and down market. And then promotion, which is many people are not even aware that it's it's there. So so we're embarking on a promotion campaign just to let people know that you know you can and should save for, for your future. Um, and, and then pricing, just um, how much does it take them to, to sign up for that? And, and the pricing to get into the micro pension or fees are lower than it is with the normal pensions in the formal sector. So that's, in my view, um, using the 4P models, how, how I think we should be looking at you know, pensions for, for those in the informal sector. Um, I look at the mobile company numbers coming through from your side of the world, uh, and to some extent, I'm a little envious. It's a huge mobile money market. But given given that potential that we see in Nigeria, this is me speaking as an outsider here, given the potential we see in Nigeria um, in terms of population, the number of people who use mobile money services, the, the size of the unbanked population, it, on paper, it seems like you have all the ingredients you need to essentially, you know, have a relatively scalable, large-scale way of getting people into the pension market, but that's not happening yet. Why? Yeah, so so pensions is is highly regulated, um, just in terms of who manages it. Um, you know, so I, I've gotten this a couple of times, and it's different from a savings or investment. So if you want people to save or people to invest, it's easier. But then when when you now begin to talk about Things like custodians, and, and, and I'll just hop on to Marsha in terms of, you know, if you're investing in the pensions, you know, it, it needs to go through a custodian. So those linkages um, um, sort of make it a, a, a bit not as smooth sailing as um, just opening an account or an investment. But so those are some of the things we're trying to see how how we can, we, we can on paper, it, it seems like the market is huge, and it is. But you know, trying to get into the minds of of those people who are saving for twenty years when they are not sure that the pension industry will be around for twenty years because they still have legacy issues. So just getting into their space and using people that they um, believe they trust. You know, sometimes they don't trust the men in suits. The people like Gatia, they, they, they just they don't trust them. They just want you know. <laughs> 
So all those nuances come into play, and 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 it's a, a strategy that, that we're working through, and 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 we'll crack it hopefully, um, not just in Nigeria but but across Africa because it's a time bomb waiting to happen if we have so many people who retire in future years and don't have pensions. Indeed, uh, Gatti, I'm going to come to you um, uh, on this because for, for an East African perspective, because you know we, we keep talking about how mobile money is explosive uh, in terms of its growth, in terms of its lending, uh, digital lending products here were had a book of about 5.1 billion dollars in NCBA's case um, as of last year. So there's there's a culture we're used to using mobile money services here for borrowing and to some extent some saving, but what about pensions? How do we get the informal sector in? Uh, I, I'll be very honest. It's a uh, it's a tough one to crack, and I won't pretend I have the answer. Uh, but I will say that uh, we must be clear that uh, maybe if I could add a fifth P, and that is problem. Are we addressing a problem? Yeah, we've just had you know which has just told us you know the the if you're earning under two dollars a day, is pension really the first thing you think about in the morning? Yeah, when you get up. Yeah, and if it isn't, then it makes sense that it would be deprioritized um, behind other other um, other priorities. So the way I think about it, and um, I don't know whether this makes a compelling business case or if this is the right way to look at it, is you first have to ensure that you can grow the disposable income or you can grow the incomes of of the informal sector such that there is something to save, such that there is something to think about for, you know, in 20 years or in 10 years' time, what, you know, what's, what, 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 what would I want to receive as, you know, a pension, pension payment? Um, if, 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 if we don't address that, then I think that we might, be, we might be creating a product that is or a solution for a problem that isn't there. Um, and so for me, um, I tip my hat to those who are trying to figure out this, uh, this, 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 this issue because it's, it certainly is very hard and it's multifaceted and it's not, uh, it's not something that I believe just requires just one lever to be pulled and suddenly you have the solution. So I don't know whether I've been very helpful there. All I'm basically telling you is that it's, 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 it, there, there's a reason why it hasn't been done. It's a, it's a very tough nut to crack. No, that's that's entirely valid. It's it's a, it's an entirely valid um, argument that you're making there, and it's it's certainly a, a perspective that we do need to to pay a lot of attention to um, as as we move forward. Um, there's a question that's come through from the audience here. Um, I'm going to throw this to you, Ngatia uh, Ogoche, and, and Makubala as well. If you want to join in, please do. Uh, here's a question: Would a tax incentive increase Africa's green infrastructure? attractiveness to domestic and global pension fund investors. And part of the framing of the question here is that this particular question is looking at how uh, municipal market, municipal bond markets rather, um, work in the US. And they're saying, I mean, if you've got pension funds that are putting money into infrastructure over there, what do we need to do on this end of the world um, to make green infrastructure attractive to domestic and global pension funds? Um, Ngachi, do you want to take the first crack on that? Sure. Um, I think tax incentives are very, very important. Um, they're very helpful, and they could be the difference between a project that is, um, you know, viable to one that is attractive. Uh, but I certainly don't think they're what takes a project from being unbankable to bankable. Yeah. So that's 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 the first thing. Secondly, tax incentives allow, in many cases our government's way of uh, enabling the environment without actually having to, to use hard cash. I just mentioned that hard cash is in, is in hard, is in, is in, you know, it's, 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 it's in low supply right now with all the competing needs that governments have. So in, our, in the case of Kenya, what we have seen, especially in the case of, uh, uh, let's use affordable housing, um, the government recognized that the private sector development community uh, you know, needed to see affordable housing as a compelling asset class. Uh, and the first thing that they, 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 they did on that is try to reduce the cost of construction. And one of the biggest components in uh, any development is VAT, value-added tax of 16%. So by simply waiving 
VAT for affordable housing. Um, the the uh, potential developers now have greater leeway to further reduce their pricing. So in a sense, government is able to achieve their goal of affordable housing at the expense of not receiving you know, the VAT component that would have received. And, and it's, a, it's a fair trade because you know, on the flip side, for every house that's built, you, know, you get something like four direct jobs, eight indirect jobs. And from that kind of employment creation, you more than make up for what you lose out in, in, in that VAT component. And that's even before uh, thinking that uh, or, or arguing that um, if, they, if there are no houses that are being, being built at all, then no VAT is being collected anyway. Yeah, so it's really not a sacrifice in, in, in reality that the government is making. It's theoretical. They are losing something that was theoretical. So um, VAT and any other tax exemption is, is, is a very powerful tool that governments can use, especially governments that are facing fiscal constraints right now. Indeed, and we'll we'll be hearing just you know for for global context for our audience, we'll certainly be hearing a lot more around um, those constraints uh, in the next 24, 48 hours uh, from the World Bank's uh, spring meeting. Some pretty interesting reports coming out there um, in the next 24, 48 hours or so. Um, Oguche, I, I want to bring the same question to you, but I want to twist it just a little bit. Um, in our context, when we speak about green investments and green bonds, um, is is there actually a business? To, to, to green infrastructure uh, across across sub-Saharan Africa. Because if you think about what people do, for example, like in affordable housing, you put up a house, you inevitably will have solar, pal- solar panels at one point, you'll have water harvesting at one point. By default, a lot of the things that we tend to be already green anyway. So is this perhaps a case of just, for lack of a better word, greenwashing? Yeah, there, there, there is a bit of that and perhaps a lot of that. And, you know, green bonds seem to be the new buzzword um, and, and there seems to be a head mentality. Um, but my view, um, honestly, is that, you know, we need to give incentives so that the investment goes out. We, we in, in Africa and especially Nigeria, we need more roads, more power, more water, more houses. It doesn't matter whether it's green or not, in my view. What, what we need is you know, the churn to happen a bit quicker. We, we, need, we need the transactions to come out quicker. So um, what you will see sometimes is some people have an allocation to finance some green um, transactions. And that, and that money is there for two, three, four years because they can't find those green transactions. And then the development doesn't go to the people that need it, right? Um, sometimes you'll see, you know, because you want to do a, a, a green transaction, the, the ticket size is small and then the pension funds are not willing to invest because it's small. So I think we need to look at it holistically in terms of what do we want to do for what's our priority, which is development. And people need jobs, people need homes, like we spoke about the micro pensions. People need to increase their sources of income. They are not necessarily looking at, you know, whether it's um, a greenhouse or a, a green transaction. And those are good, but I think those are the niceties in the house. So the house needs to be there. I need to get a house to live before I think of furniture. But I think the green transaction is trying to put the furniture first before the house. That's my view, though. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. from Later's perspective. Um, Yes. The the other other twist I could perhaps put in on this would be green infrastructure, but green by whose standards? Ours or Western standards? (laughs) Yeah, look, uh, this is another important topic. Um, So I'm very big on ESG, um, uh, Mr. Rama. I'm very big, in fact, and Ms. Masha is here. As we talk now, you know, the the main news in South Africa uh, are around a flood which happened in one of our provinces, uh, Natal. I've never seen such uh, flooding in my, you know, 46 years of existence. And that's that's talking to the climate change, right? So, so, so those issues are real. <laughs> and 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 the second issue, I think you would have picked up, Mr. Rama. We we I lost connection for a few seconds. It's because we are going through load shedding this side. So, ESCOM is literally coal driven. Uh, we all know the carbon footprint of of coal. 
And so the question is, do you then um, tell investors to stop investing in ESCOM, um, knowing that if, if indeed ESCOM shuts down, it will take your economy with you? And, and that's the reality of because it's a monopoly, right? Um, and so, you know, as a regulator, we, we issued guidance to the industry, particularly retirement funds around ESG, and how they should um, factor ESG, requiring them in the investment policy statement to have very explicit, you know, statements in terms of how they will go about um, considering ESG um, 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 issues. And and my approach has been, and it, it starts answering your question. There is a reality in Africa. Um, which which does require one to be careful, you know, how one, you know, progresses ESG. And, and as I was using the ESCOM example, so as much as we all aspire to a green environment, a better environment, there is that reality that it cannot happen overnight. And so, so my approach has been that you are actually arguably more influential if you are an investor in an entity like ESCOM, because you are able to influence their trajectory, right? If, if you sell their bonds, you lose that influence, right? But if you remain invested, you are, you are able to say to a company like ESCOM, you need to change the way you, you do business and the way you behave, right? And so over time, you need to move away from, from, from coal. And, and I think that transition and the transitional costs are very important um, for, for Africa in a country like, like, like South Africa. So one does need to get that balance uh, right, Mr. Rama. Indeed. Um, Jacqueline Irving, of course, from IFC, is still with us um, on the call. I've seen, you, I've seen you respond to the question around green incentives and taxes uh, in the chat, but I'd just like to bring you in um, to the conversation uh, for the benefit of our audience who may not be able to see this. Thank you. I'm not officially in the panel, but and, and certainly my colleagues Olanu, Nagatia, and Aguche could speak better to this more directly. But summarizing from the findings that my African development colleagues and I um, have based on our study, where we we actually went out to the local capital market stakeholders, the, the pension funds and and the regulators, we found that the we were told that for local investor interest in green bonds to grow and develop. That, that, that further clarity may still be needed. Colleagues have mentioned this, depending on market context on the part of regulators and policymakers on the taxonomies, the reporting procedures, the standards, and importantly, the niche sub-asset classes. Most longer-term asset managers uh, across the focus markets, the African focus markets of our study, with whom we conferred, uh, emphasized that the starting point for green assets um, must be the potential to generate adequate returns and reflect fair pricing. And of course, Masha and others also mentioned this at, at the outset of our discussion today. Uh, green bonds, social bonds related assets, you know, they're an important new asset class that would benefit from more education and awareness raising around the risk reward trade off in the green and sustainability space. And, and so to this end, we were told by, by pension market stakeholders in our seven focus markets that more engagement, beginning importantly with the pension fund trustees, and again, colleagues in the panel could speak better and directly to this, but beginning with the pension fund trustees and society more broadly is needed as a starting point. At the same time, the pension funds and asset managers with, with whom we conferred did indicate they've begun selectively factoring in ESG consideration and considering investments in particular sectors. Healthcare came out, green housing, depending on the market. And they were emphasizing one ESG aspect, broadly speaking, over others oftentimes. And, 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 and governance often came up as, 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 as the ESG aspect of emphasis. All right. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for your input. Um, Masha, welcome back. Um, Connections having a bit of a problem on your side of the world. Um, but I'm did, very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's it's how we're operating in the world of Zoom these days. Um, that said, before before I get back to, to the question around um, getting informal players into the market from a custodial mm -hmm. perspective, did you want to weigh in on the green question? Yeah. So 
like Mr. Alana, I'm a huge opponent of ESG, right? I think it's absolutely important. I come from that uh, place, Durban, which has those floods at the moment. So I know my family's there. So I've seen videos. It's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. You know, largely speaking, and I'm going to go even bigger than pension funds. If we're talking about ESG and we're talking about investors in general, right? And we see this new age of investors coming in. You know, the whole thing about reward. Reward actually is not as important comparatively to the overall equity as I'm looking at this from an overall investment side. So if we're getting these new younger investors that really care about what's happening to the environment, that really care about social development, actually investing in environmentally, socially, and with proper governance around these instruments becomes even more relevant. So I think we're seeing that shift. I think from an overall pension fund perspective, and Aguchi, I get you. I get you. I see it here as well, right? You want to get people in homes and you want to do it fast. But I've also seen housing, which has solar geysers, which actually is becoming environmentally friendly and helping the environment at the same time. So it's about that balance. And going back to Jacqueline's point about balance and Alana is really just making sure that we're getting the right balance that as we're starting to invest, and ESG has to come into play. And I even think about it from a pension fund perspective, even how your asset managers are voting on proxies becomes relevant. If I look at the big pension funds in South Africa, this is huge. This is huge. It's like companies like Proximity, and I, I don't know whether you guys know the company Proximity, it actually started off at Citibank, which is really about proxy voting is fully fledged ESG offering. And that's what these pen, the pension funds would actually need because it's more about, and I know in Sub-Saharan Africa, we think we are later to the party than our Western counterparts. You know, they have benefited from being able to use coal and using everything else. I get it. Unfortunately, though, we are where we are and we can't make the situation worse. So that was my point at ESG. <laughs> um, what about from and just to wrap up the question around getting um, yes. exp expanding coverage into informal markets as well fr from a custodial perspective? Um, what are the sort of challenges that you run into in trying to aggregate all these, you know, small irregular bits of income that are flowing in to a fund that, you know, you're, you're essentially a, a, a custodian of? I think from a custodian perspective, is not really an issue, right? Let me be very honest, because all of the aggregation and the heavy lifting is done before it comes to us. Having said that, though, I think, you know, the earlier points around training and a good point about promotion, I think he used as one of the P's into getting people to understand what the value is. And I get the fact that $2. I mean, if you've got $2, you're really going to worry about food, et cetera. But it's about understanding that, you know, whereas Africa, all of us take care of our parents and that's the way we are, right? In South Africa, we call it black tax. right? But the point is, we all have the value of actually taking care and all of us do it. The reality is that more and more people are moving away from home. And guess what? That connection gets less. And if that connection gets less, what's the actual benefit? You're probably not going to even take care of your parents. You know, hand on heart, I'm not that person. But there will be a lot. The next generation might actually be that. So we need to start actually empowering the young people now to understand what the importance of pension fund building is. But perhaps not doing it in a typical way. You know, I see in Naira in Nigeria, for example, this is going to be different, right? You're going to pay your pensions in in, in Naira. You don't have to have a bank account. And I'm a banker, and this is being recorded, so it's not a city view, but I'm giving you a view anyway. Okay? We have to figure out what ways from a digital perspective that we can do different things in Africa. We, South Africa is very developed, I have to get it, but we have an informal you know, community as well. But if I look at markets like Nigeria, and look at the massive amount of work that's happened in Kenya. It's really incredible, right? I, I know there's a pension fund thing in Kenya, and I was reading about it, that you can put in money as and when you have it. So it's not a defined thing that you have to do every month. When you do have money, you do it and you buy a product. And I think we as a financial industry and as Africans, again, whether it's a custodian or otherwise, need to come up with solutions to see how do we price it differently? How do we take away some of that latent pricing? How do we make it a lot easier for these people that are earning potentially two to five dollars a day to actually start participating and adding value to their lives? All right. Um, I'd like to move to to the final focus uh, of our conversation around pooling 
pooling resources. I mean, pension funds are really doing that essentially at, at, at national level. But I want to scale that up. I want to get to a situation where uh, members of the consortium that Ngachi is representing, for example, can go and co-invest uh, with uh, the pension fund operators that Gucci is uh, representing. They can go and invest in building renewable energy, for example, power plants, wind farms, solar farms um, in South Africa. Uh, Ngachi, from, from your perspective, is, is there a significant business opportunity to do that across a continent? And if so, what are the bottlenecks that you're running into in these cross-border pooled investments? No, absolutely. And um, it's being done right now as we speak, but it's being done by third party fund managers who go to every jurisdiction and uh, raise capital from pension schemes as limited partners into their, into their, their, their funds, essentially pooling uh, Kenyan pension schemes, Nigerian pension schemes, South African pension schemes, to look at pan-African opportunities. So um, this isn't, a, con this isn't a, a new concept. It's actually a tried and tested business model. Now, the, 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 I think the difference in what we're talking about or how I see it differently is in the absence of having single investors from each um, jurisdiction. So instead of having... 10 different Kenyan pension schemes and 10 different Nigerian pension schemes, what if we pooled um, essentially all Kenyan or, or those 10 into one vehicle and the Nigerian 10 into one vehicle, then essentially you have two investors into one, into one vehicle, and then we can look at, at, at investment opportunities that way. Now, it could be, you know, it could be argued, you could argue whether that's more efficient or whether there are, I'm sure there are some pros and cons to that. To that versus uh, the current version, but I definitely do think it's worth exploring. Um, so if we, if, we, if, we, if we look even beyond just cross-regional, if we just look at local, for example, this is where I mentioned the, the uh, pooling as a tool or the solution to the size of the opportunities. And so if you think about some of these infrastructure opportunities being regional, uh, that problem becomes even larger, yeah? The means the projects are even larger. And then in that case, it means the capital need is, is significantly greater. And by pooling, um, by pooling resources from multiple pension schemes together, that's one solution to it. But uh, Rama, if, if you think about it critically, that's exactly what a, a fund manager does right now. Uh, indeed. Um, let, me, let me take that question from a slightly different tack uh, for you, Ogoche, because a lot of people from, from outside Nigeria look at the market and think huge population, massive opportunities virtually everywhere you go. But getting capital in is relatively straightforward. Getting it out, on the other hand, that's a different ballgame altogether. Um, to what extent does that sort of problem around FX uh, make it difficult for your members um, to not only make Nigeria an attractive place for pension fund investment, but also to co to invest with other funds elsewhere in the continent? Yeah, um, I, I wish I had the answer, um, but it, it's it's something that you know what we're trying to crack. Um, FX issues are a major issue um, in Nigeria. Um, devaluation um, and, and COVID hasn't helped. So um, currently, we're not even allowed to invest offshore um, as, as local pension funds. So, so, so that's an issue. Um, so in that regard, there, there is you know, different schools of thoughts. And one school of thoughts is, you know, we should develop our own country. We should invest in our country. Another school of thought is we need to diversify. And I think it's not one or the other. You know, we, we can have two of them. Uh, the, the challenge is, is how do we um, be able to, to, to find the balance? And, and, and it goes up to also uh, regulation. Um, I, I think that there was one thing that um, I wanted to add in the regulation bits, you know, which I thought of later is, you know, we would want the regulators to work in sync. So the monetary authorities and the fiscal authorities to, to, to work in sync. Uh, Igatia mentioned something about you know, a tax break somewhere, but then the fact that you're able to get houses uh, and then you're able to get you know, people that are working and you're able to pay taxes. So you know, allowing local pension funds to invest offshore, um, at, at some point, you know, the dividends 
and the interest is going to come back to the country and it's going to help build the reserve. So that's some of the thinking that we would like to to drive from our own end in terms of, you know, you, you might lose on one end, but you could gain on the other end. So if uh, Nigerian pension funds are a able to invest in Kenya, um, South Africa, you know, that will also spark a reciprocity. And, you know, so, so you know, those things need to happen. I, I know there's some work on the AFCA uh, allowing, you know, um, fund managers within countries to invest in other countries without having to convert. And, and that would be great. And I think we need to work around Africa to be able to invest across Africa without having to convert to um, foreign currencies. And I think that will, will be something that will take this to another level. Uh, indeed. Uh, actually, just a very quick follow up on that uh, for your Gucci and Fungatia, to, to, because that that whole process of converting from, you know, you move from from the shilling to the dollar, you move from the naira to the dollar, the rand to the dollar. Uh, to what extent does that essentially, you know, just act as a as a disincentive for you to even consider offshore investments? I mean, at, at this point in time, you know, we're looking at currencies getting hit pretty much across the board. The SEDI in, 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 in Ghana is down, what, I think 15 plus percent so far this year. The Kenyan shillings lost around 3 percent to the dollar. Uh, Egypt devalued the pound um, fairly recently. When, you, when you're trying to make these investment decisions, I mean, that whole conversion into the dollar business does it is it is it a huge obstacle for for your um, for in in you deciding to to invest or not? I wouldn't say it's it's an it's an obstacle, but um, yes, it is something that does in, you know increase uncertainty. Yeah, and um, uncertainty is is something that you know we typically look to reduce rather than to increase. Um, so where we can invest in local currency, uh, you'd find that uh, we, are, we are much more comfortable doing it that way because where well, it's an, in, well, it's a, a, an a investment opportunity in foreign currency, then you must also start, uh, you must also get a, take a view on the FX. And, um, you know, it's hard enough to, to have a view on the infrastructure opportunity in the first place. Then now you have to overlay effects on that. It's, it's, it's very tough. And, and, and fine, the, 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 the trend so far has been that hard currencies have been appreciating versus our local currencies. And so you do get that bump in return, but that's only, that's only now. If uh, the situation was to flip, then you could have a situation where the, the returns you're seeking so desperately from these infrastructure opportunities are then now eaten by, by, by currency depreciation. And um, we have seen that the attempts to hedge that risk out are just too expensive um, if you can even get banks that can give you that kind of, uh, um, that kind of service. So, um, you know, it's, we'd rather not increase our uncertainty and so where we can invest in local currency, we will. Uh, but we do understand that a lot of these opportunities are dollar denominated. And if that's the case, then we have to take the risk in, in the hard currency. Indeed. There's, there's an interesting question coming through from uh, the audience here. ESG issues uh, seems to have um, gotten quite a bit of traction in the audience. Uh, this is from Adebayo Adebowale. He's asking why the impact of pension funds on the contribution to issues around SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, why is that not on the front burner? Because profitability and safety are down the line that may not even be necessary if the environment has already been destroyed, if inequality is at a crazy level, if poverty is leading to unsafe cities. Um, Oh, Marco Bella, I saw you responding to this uh, in chat. Do, do you want to take that question first? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's a short response. I, I, I mean, the, the audience member is right. And I always say, you know, it's fine having very good retirement benefits, but there's no point retiring in a wasteland, uh, and, and honestly speaking, uh, right? Because then you can't enjoy your money. Um, two, there's no point, you know, retiring in a country with high inequality. It, and we have, we have experienced this in South Africa last year with social uprisings, um, right? And, and so the bottom line is that, yes, um, one does need to appreciate the importance of financial return, and, and that's right. But, you know, ultimately, if, if you are going to, to, to retire in a dysfunctional country, society, 
um, it, it, it really begs the point, you know, um, because even that benefit, you won't be able to enjoy it properly, you know, if, if, if you are in a very unstable uh, country. Indeed, wholly agree. Um, we are about six minutes to the end of the session, so I do want to bring uh, the conversation to a close. I'm going to go around my panelists today and ask you for your closing thoughts. Where should we go from here with respect to the three issues uh, that we've discussed? Enabling regulation, expanding into unexplored territory, roping in the, the informal markets, but also pooling resources to co-invest together. Um, Gatti, you got the first crack at this, then we'll go to Aguche. Uh, thank you very much. I think, um, firstly, let's do all we can, uh, and that includes the regulator, that includes the you know stakeholders like the fund managers and the likes, um, to build up the understanding of these alternative assets. First things first, we're not going to invest in anything we don't understand. Uh, so that's the first thing. But secondly, it's to recognize where we are on this journey, and it is a journey. Um, and I think uh, trying to accelerate or trying to, to leapfrog certain steps to get us to a certain outcome um, could have some painful unintended consequences. Uh, and I think what we, what we should be doing is, be, is to recognize that it's going to take us some time and be patient to get to where we're trying to go. We have the benefit of seeing where other jurisdictions have reached and how they have got where they have so we can learn from them and not necessarily reinvent the wheel. But just again, to reiterate that this is a marathon rather than a sprint. And um, we talk about being long-term holders of capital, being long-term investors. I think we should also start thinking the same. Yeah, let's be long-term too. Oh, Gurcheng, you have the floor. Thanks. I'd like to echo Kat, uh, Gatia's uh, thoughts and comments and just um, use that um, sort of to answer the, the bio's comments and, and, and end with that in terms of uh, why are pension funds not looking at impact and, and front and center and to say it's, it's a journey. It's a journey. Um, at least in, in Nigeria, we had to get to a position whereby we moved from publicly managed pension funds to private Privately managed pension funds. So we're on a journey in Africa, and we're just beginning to see that process whereby we have fund managers, we have fund custodians. There's an industry building. Before there wasn't an industry, there's an industry building. And once that industry builds, then we begin to build expertise. We begin to get knowledge from elsewhere. We begin to have this sort of um, events and, 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 and hear what other people are doing, and, and then begin to move together towards uh, impact, which is where we need to, to get to. But um, I, I think there's a story I, I had. I, I, I had the opportunity of working with, with the government as, as an advisor to a minister. And I said, you know, I really want to help the country. People are suffering and people don't have food. I, I, and he said to me, you know, don't lose your financial self because you are passionate. So you want to help, but passion is not enough. You need to use finance to be able to help. So we can't just say we want to get impact and throw money at projects. We need to do it in a way whereby it's sustainable. Is coming back and we can invest again. So those sort of structures are what we need to build. You know, we can't just move with passion and say we want to, you know, impact and then um, we don't get the money back. So we need to use finance to be able to help those that need that. I think that those are my closing remarks. Masha, you have the floor. Yeah, I mean, the big thing for me, right, and I think we've said it across the board, a lot of it is about education, whether it's asset managers, it's the informal sector, it's how do we actually educate to so actually increase uh, inclusivity in pension funds, but also in how we invest, whether it's infrastructure, etc. You know, uh, and Gatia, I actually think we can deprog certain things. I think that we can take the benefit from learning from others, absolutely. But also in the fact that we are starting off later, we have the value of the world's changing. There's the digital thing, evolution that's happening. We as Africans can really use that to see how we can take it you know, quicker, faster. And I do believe, yes, we long-term invest 100%, but probably do it in a more nimble way. Important to being nimble. Um, Jacqueline, do you want to throw in any closing comments um, as we wrap up? 
uh, colleagues have already made <clears throat> most of the salient points, uh, very important points. I, I suppose from the perspective of, of working within a DFI, just as a takeaway, it's 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 and, and this is a takeaway from 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 the the study that I've most recently worked on and and, and have drawn on the insights of colleagues uh, on the panel. It's also important for DFIs and working with national policymakers and market stakeholders to in, in helping develop these pension markets to keep in mind that the type of product most in demand, short supply varies considerably depending on macroeconomic context and level of development of the national uh, local the local capital market. So and the national regulatory reforms and product development innovations that would be intended to increase uh, investor take up of particular asset classes won't be effective if the underlying national macroeconomic policy context is not conducive. So a context where short-term government securities are paying very high yields, that crowd out private sector borrowing provide no incentive for investors to diversify their portfolios. This is sort of taking it back to one of the, the, the starting point themes of, of this particular discussion. So, so there's no incentive to diversify away from the, the relatively low risk high return assets. So, so this points to the importance of the sequencing of national policy reforms, the underlying macroeconomic and overall policy framework, providing the right foundations uh, for policies that could help develop the, the local capital market, then including the buy side. Indeed. Um, uh, Mr. Marco Bele, you're, you're, you're getting the last word on this. Um, we certainly do not want to, to retire in a wasteland. Um, so your closing remarks, please. Thank you, Mr. Rama. So, so I think as a regulator, it's quite important for us to be open-minded um, and to get the balance um, right. You know, as a regulator, whenever the industry approaches you with a new idea, the default is always to be suspicious, right? Because you think they're trying to get around your regulations and your rules. And so engagement is important to try and understand, you know, what the industry, you know, is trying to achieve, where, it, where it's coming from, um, and to provide the guidance, you know, um, uh, required. So so I, I definitely think, you know, a to use Ms. Marsha's way, to, you know, being nimble as a regulator is, is very important. Um, thanks. Much appreciated. And, and of course, thank you to you as well, um, our audience. You've been with us for the last 19 minutes. We're now bringing uh, this particular edition of the AFI's uh, webinars over to a close. I'd like to extend a very big thank you uh, to all the individuals who've taken out their time to be on this panel, to provide the expertise. Um, Jacqueline Irving from the IFC, Ngata Kirunga from the Kenya Pension Funds Investment Consortium, Ogiche Aguda from the Pension Fund Operators Association of Nigeria, Masha Maraj from the uh, Security Services Cluster at City, and of course, Olano Makubela from the Financial Sector Regulator in South Africa. You've been watching one of our regular webinars here from the Africa SEO Forum. We'll look forward to joining you for the next one, hopefully physically, not virtually. Um, thank you very much for your time. Have a good day.